Um, and right here in San Diego, by the way. So if you have any questions at all, uh, any of this stuff pertains to you. So there's a couple of utilities on the IRS's website, which is irs.gov, where if you haven't filed a return at all, you can put in some bank information. You can file if, um, if you don't have a filing requirement because you didn't make enough money, you can file what's called a dummy return. It's just a dollar of income. There's no tax associated, but you file a return. So that puts you into the system so that they can send you a check or a payment. Then what happens, and this is where there's a lot of confusion, in 2020, you reconcile the credit on your tax return. So for example, the way that a single taxpayer is, you're eligible if your income is below $75,000 for the full payment. If your income is above $75,000 for every dollar above $75,000, you lose a nickel of stimulus payment. Use 5% of of the amount that's above 75. So if you're if you're at 80,000, you're going to take 80 minus 75, which is 5,000, you multiply that by 5%. And that's the amount of the stimulus payment that you lose. You'll max out losing your payment at around 98000 if you're single. Thank you for doing that math. Yeah. If you're, if you're married, you just double those numbers. Okay. So if you're making 100000 and you're single, you're not going to get a payment. If you're making seventy five dollars or less and, you, and you're single, you'll get a $1,200 payment for an adult and a $500 if you have a dependent child. Um, then in 2020, when you file your tax return, and for a lot of people, our incomes are going to be lower in 2020. You file the tax return and your actual payment is calculated. So if I have, for example, I have in 2019, I have $85,000 in income, I'm single. And in 2020, I have $60,000 in income and I'm single. In 2020, I'm going to qualify for the full payment. In 2019, I got part of it, so I'm going to get the rest. I'm going to get the part that I didn't get because in 2019, my income was higher. Hmm. If the opposite happens where I'm lucky enough and my income goes up, and this year I get the full amount because I'm at 60000 and next year I, I won't get the full amount because I'm at 85000 I don't have to pay back the amount, the extra amount that I got which is really great. I got my full amount this year. There's a couple of problems that are happening. One is deceased people are receiving payments that they shouldn't be receiving. And so, but the, the law itself does not say that there's a requirement by law to pay the money back. The IRS is saying it should be paid back. So you've got some people who are deciding that means I'm not gonna pay it back. You know, your mother or your father or your aunt dies and you get the check because you're the beneficiary or you're the administrator of the estate. A lot of people are saying there's no law that says I have to send it back. I ain't sending it back. A lot of people are saying, well, the right thing to do is to send it back. So there's going to be some haves and have nots, some ethical choices that people are making. And there's a lot of confusion around that. Um, and the other thing is people who owe tax who don't have direct deposit of a refund, they're waiting for checks and they may have moved since the last time they filed a tax return. So there's a lot of confusion around it. Um, but in theory, it's a really good thing to be able to do. And there's some discussion about taking that as a first step and moving forward with it up to a $2,000 a month per taxpayer gift, basically from the government, a, a, you know, a non-payable loan is really what it turns out to be. So that hasn't happened yet, and I don't know if, or if and when it will, but that's sort of part of the conversation. So you said dummy return, and uh, I resonated with that. I think that actually personifies best every return I've ever <laughs> filed, except the ones with you, young man, Dave Yoshida, Fortunate Fields, um, and right here in San Diego, by the way. So if you have any questions at all, uh, any of this stuff pertains to you, you know, actually on that note, um, Dave, I didn't even tell you this, but yeah, I've had more conversations this year from people who, you know, did taxes on their own or, you know, maybe did the little, um, what is it, the turbo deal or whatever, you know. And so, like, I think, you know, now more than ever, you know, it's, it's important to get a pro on those numbers to make sure that you're optimizing any and all of these uh, programs for yourself, especially when it matters the most. So I appreciate you spending some time with us on this. 
What what do you? Um, this may or may not be your domain of expertise, but what's going on with the PPP? They are the, the payment protection program. Like, yeah. it, can you give us a basic understanding about all that and stuff? And then, like, how is it forgiven? Sure. Okay. So there's a couple of things, that, and and before the PPP, there's something called the Economic Impact Disaster Loan and Grant, and that's that's what you hear as EIDL, and then the EIDL grant. The economic impact disaster loans have always existed with the Small Business Administration. Any business experiencing hardship can always apply for these loans. And if they meet the qualifications, they get it. And those are loans. They're just low interest, long term, easy to deal with loans. But part of the PPP, which is the Paycheck Protection Program, is something called an economic impact grant. And the way this is supposed to work, and it hasn't unfortunately worked this way, but the way this is supposed to work is you apply for this grant and the grant is step one of your application for the PPP loan. And you get the grant, originally it was supposed to be $10,000. They were running out of money very quickly and so they changed that to $1,000 per employee. Okay. So let's say you have a business with three employees, you're gonna get a $3,000 grant. If you apply for the PPP and you received a $3,000 grant and the PPP application is rejected for whatever reason, that $3,000 is a grant, it's, it's free money. So you use it for whatever you, business expense you wanna use it for and you're done. But if, you're, if you have the PPP if you receive that, what's supposed to happen is the amount that you qualify for is reduced by the amount of the grant that you received. Hmm. But what happened was the grants, took, the, the grants took too long to issue. And this is actually what happened in my case. The grant took too long to issue. I got the PPP. I was supposed to get less PPP because I got a grant. And now when I have forgiveness, I have to subtract the amount of my grant from what can be forgiven so that the, the grant portion turns into a loan is what happens. Hmm. So all of that said, what the PPP is designed for is to help people keep people on payroll. And that's to help people continue to work. You know, if a business is closed and people aren't working because they're their physical presence is required as opposed to working remotely, the PPP is still designed to keep folks on payroll so that when the business can reopen, the same folks who've already been trained and know the business and know their jobs, those same folks can be rehired basically or continue to be hired and work. And so the, the PPP is calculated based on your payroll cost for two and a half months and your average cost for the for the more, a recent two and a half months period. And then over the, the two months after you are, after you receive the PPP money, 75% of your expenses that go towards forgiveness have to be payroll expenses. And payroll expenses include wages, bonuses, employer sponsored, um, Employ, uh, retirement contributions in state payroll taxes, but not federal payroll taxes. Huh. And those are capped at an annualized hundred thousand dollars. So if you have a an individual making more than a hundred thousand, then the um, the loan is figured on a hundred thousand divided by fifty two, which is about nineteen hundred dollars a week. Um, if they're making less than 100,000, then all of those expenses are added in and you spend the money exactly as you would. And the remaining 25% of the money can be used for rent, utilities, mortgage interest on a building that the business owns. <laughs> and if you use the money that way or use 75% for payroll expenses and use 25% for the, those expenses that I mentioned, then the loan, then it'll be forgiven. And it'll be forgiven in such a way that it's not taxable income, hmm. which is really great. Yeah. Um, the big problem right now, and I think it's a problem that will be fixed, is that the expenses that are used, the expenses that are incurred with money 
that's forgiven debt are not deductible. 